very warm welcome this morning to Worthing Baptist Church. Can I encourage you to hang around, not rush away after the service unless you want to, unless you need to. But let's have a coffee, let's have some cake together, let's get to know each other a little bit better. And especially for visitors, you're welcome to, to do that as well. That's what we'd be saying under normal circumstances. But as you and I know, these aren't normal circumstances. But those times will come. Those times will come when we can do those kind of things, when we can have barbecues outside the church building or going to the beach for a barbecue, picnic on the beach, paddle boarding in the sea, all that kind of stuff. That will come again. And let's encourage each other with those thoughts that we will get back to some kind of normality one day. But in the meantime, as we come together to worship this morning, let's commit to living each day at a time and appreciating all that we have. However little we have, there is still something, I guess, for each of us to be thankful for. Let's come with thanksgiving in our hearts this morning and hope of what's going to come tomorrow. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter gates with thanksgiving and his court with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations.
Good morning, here I am with my toast. It's breakfast time and I am very grateful now for my daily bread and Frisbee would quite like some of this as well. Uh, I'm very grateful now for my daily bread because if I'm honest, a few weeks back um, it was hard to get bread. And not only was it hard to get bread, but lots of people started making bread for themselves and so things like flour and yeast um, became unavailable as well. And one time when I got back from the supermarket, all I had bread related were some bread sticks and that didn't quite do it for the week. A few people at Worthing Baptist Church have been making bread this week and looking at their videos, I realized actually how much work it takes to make bread. Let's have a look at that now. Hi everyone, so today I'm making a cob loaf and you will need 480 grams of plain flour, 20 grams of butter, a pinch of salt, a packet of dried yeast, a glass bowl, a rolling pin, a flat baking sheet and a roasting tray. for 10 minutes until soft and smooth. After the hour, your dough should have doubled in size. So next, you knock out the air, shape it into a round bowl and proof it for a further 30 minutes. After proving for a further 30 minutes, make three or four incisions, making sure not to cut too deep, and then sprinkle with some flour and place at the middle shelf of the oven at 230 degrees for 30 minutes. Oh my god! Wow. That's amazing. Look at it. This is what your bread should look like, hopefully. And now we're gonna try some. Lovely bread. Thank you so much, Mona. Next stage is bongo drums. <laughs> Just kneading the dough. <laughs> Woo, bread! So the bread... <laughs> the bread has risen and... Um, I've now cut it into <laughs> booth. It took me a while to do this, but I've created the bread that I've made myself. I'll just show you. Time to go into the oven! Oh. <laughs> oh, this is my nuts. Well noted. So, the finished bread! Woo! How amazing is that, that people from our church can actually make bread from scratch? I wouldn't know where to start with that. So well done to those of you who are doing that this week. When I look at those videos, I realise that actually it's hard work making bread. And for many people around the world, actually making bread, getting bread, working in order to buy bread is hard work and it doesn't come easy. And that's the case for many people in our country as well. I have to say that all of this has given me an insight into how difficult it can be for people to get their essential needs met. And in a way, in recent days, in recent weeks, I've been praying the Lord's Prayer in a bit of a different way. When I pray, give us this day our daily bread, I, I'm not even thinking about over-spiritualising it and thinking of bread as anything other than actual bread because the reality is many people are struggling to get bread and so when I pray it whether I'm struggling to get bread or not I'm praying give us and I think that us is really important I'm not saying give me this day my daily bread sometimes I have bread sometimes I don't have bread but when I'm praying us I'm actually praying that our needs together more than just me will be met by God and of course offer myself to God as the answer for someone's basic needs to being to be met it looks like frisbee agrees with me so that's something anyway we're going to sing now blessed be your name
Now come to that time of offering. And at this time, let us think about all the ways that our Father in heaven actually gives us our daily bread. And let's think about how in his strength, with his guidance, we can be part of his kingdom coming, his will being done on earth as well as in heaven. Let's think about how, as we pray the Lord's Prayer, in many ways we are to be the answer to others as well, that we are to be God's hands and feet and his mouthpiece and also his acts of love, his agape love in how we live on a daily basis. So let us pray. Loving God, all good, all true, all powerful, almighty, we worship you this morning. Gracious God, all loving, all merciful, all faithful, all compassionate, we thank you this morning. Mighty God, always active, always leading, always calling, always knowing, we commit ourselves afresh to you this morning. Saving God, always forgiving, always restoring, always teaching, always encouraging, we confess that we can be faithless at times and ask for you to build our trust in you. Sovereign God, all in all, now and always, we praise you, we worship you, we lift up our hearts before you today. Father God, we celebrate your goodness, your provision, and we rejoice in your blessings, we marvel at your mercy, and we thank you for your guidance. We offer our lives, the whole of our lives, in response to you this morning. Amen. Matthew, chapter 6, verses 5 to 15, prayer. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the street corners, to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you and when you pray do not keep on babbling like pagans for they think they will be heard because of their many words do not be like them for your father knows what you need before you ask him this then is how you should pray our father in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. If you've been out walking on the promenade recently, you've probably seen a new piece of graffiti art. It's of an athletic figure wearing running clothes, hands pressed together as if in prayer, with the caption, give us this day our daily exercise. The piece is by the artist Horace, aka Worthing's Banksy, and he appears to be creatively appropriating some words from the Lord's Prayer, but instead of the word bread, we find the word exercise. Perhaps the ellipsis, the dot 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 after the word exercise, leaves room for more to be added to a kind of list of necessities, I don't know. We could call this the lockdown prayer, and what I like about it is the way it draws us all in, just like the Lord's Prayer does. Give us, it says, and each person walking, running, cycling can find themselves in the us of the prayer. Horace's art is articulating life in lockdown. None of us are looking too far ahead, planning loads of things. We're just taking one day at a time and receiving our apportioned exercise, like daily bread. I wonder how many people walking past this graffiti would spot the allusion to the Lord's Prayer. I can imagine most would, and we might live in a post Christian society, but it appears the Lord's Prayer is still alive and well in our shared memory. If it wasn't, Horace's artwork would make little to no sense at all to passers-by. It would be a bit obscure. And I've noticed that the arrival of Horace's work on the promenade has coincided with another prayer-related phenomenon. 
Google searches of the word prayer have spiked in the UK in recent days, as you can see here. And if we compare searches for prayer with searches for God, we find that more people in general have been searching for God over the last 90 days, but just in the last week or so, more people have been searching for prayer than searching for God, which I find exciting, not concerning, because prayer itself is a kind of God searching, we could say. And so this piece of artwork by Horace and the search trends on Google have got me thinking, how can the Lord's Prayer be a resource for us in lockdown? In some ways, I'd love for us to work our way through the Lord's Prayer line by line. But then I remember I once did a five part preaching series on the Lord's Prayer somewhere else, not at Worthing Baptist Church. And so perhaps we would be biting off a little more than we could chew to look at the whole prayer in just one sermon. So instead of going through the prayer line by line, how about we focus on just what is extraordinary about the prayer? And by extraordinary, I mean those aspects that were groundbreaking when Jesus first gave the prayer to his disciples. Firstly, we're going to look at the word Father, which Jesus invites us to use when we address God. Then we're going to look at the part about bread, and then we're going to move on to look at forgiveness. So Father, bread, forgiveness. So firstly, how does Jesus address God? When it comes to praying the Lord's Prayer, who exactly are we talking to? Well, for Jesus, we begin with the words our Father. And most commentators agree that these, this prayer was originally written in Aramaic, not Greek, or spoken in Aramaic, not Greek, and that the word Abba was used for Father. Abba can be translated as Dad, not so formal as Father, not so childish as Daddy, but Dad. And that's important because in Jewish prayers of the time, it was common to address God as Father. But Abba, Dad, was not so common. This is actually highly unusual. And so right here we find Jesus inviting us to participate in the intimacy of his relationship with the Father. Just as an illustration, I Wikipedia'd Prince Charles's official title and I was shocked to find that it is 46 words long. But of course, William and Harry just call him Dad. And if you were some random kid adopted by him into his family, William and Harry would encourage you to call him dad too. And so when we pray our father, we're essentially participating in a story a little bit like that. You are invited to call God father or dad and the whole of the Christian faith can be summed up in Jesus the son, inviting us to share in his relationship with the father together with the Holy Spirit. Jesus goes on to clarify this father as the one in heaven, our father who is in heaven. Which is not to say that this father is out of reach somewhere, but that this father's goodness goes beyond the goodness of earthly parents and indeed beyond the earthly categories of male and female. Calling God father might be normative, but not to the exclusion of mother language, which can also be appropriate in prayer too. And with all of this, let's not forget that key word, our, our Father, our. We might pray this Lord's Prayer alone in lockdown, but when we do, we are praying in some way with people all over the world. We are praying in all sorts of languages and times, who are praying in all sorts of languages, praying in all sorts of time zones. In fact, back in 2007, apparently two billion people Two billion people prayed the Lord's Prayer on Easter Sunday. I don't know who was doing the counting, but they were clearly exhausted because there are no more recent statistics than 2007. But I can imagine it would be a lot more today uh, or Easter Sunday this year, 13 years later. When you pray, Our Father, you are not alone. There will always be someone praying it at the same time as you somewhere in the world, in some language, in some time zone. Just as Horace's us included 
dog walkers, cyclists, pushchair pushers and runners, the hour of the Lord's Prayer has space for all of us. And there's space for you in that as well. Whoever you are, you can speak to God as Father today because Jesus invites you. And the best way of finding out about prayer is not observation, not Googling your way to God, although there's some worth in that, but participation is so much better than observation. Try praying out, praying for yourself for a week, say, seeing if there's anything in it. I don't think you'll be disappointed. Let's move on now and talk about bread. Throughout Christian history, there has been a bit of a tendency to spiritualize the part of the Lord's Prayer that goes, give us today our daily bread. People have tended to see in this prayer, not literal bread, but the bread we share at communion or the scriptures that give us daily nourishment or something else. And this is partly because this petition, part of this prayer has been so notoriously difficult to interpret. There are no parallels in other ancient texts, no parallels, no other prayers that are quite like this. And like I say, we're only looking at the extraordinary parts of the Lord's Prayer this morning. And this part about bread is highly unusual. From my understanding, the, the issue here is that the prayer, as we have it in the New Testament, literally reads, give us today our bread for tomorrow which I know is not quite how we pray it or how it reads in the NIV, but I'll repeat that. Literally, give us today our bread for tomorrow or give us today our bread for the coming day. Some early Christians found all of this quite uncomfortable because it sounds like it's, a, it's contradicting Jesus' teaching about worry, which comes a few verses later, where he says, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry for about itself. And so for fear that Jesus was contradicting himself, there was this tendency to spiritualise the bread and make out that Jesus was not talking about literal physical bread for sustenance, but spiritual bread that we can ask God for. But I don't think Jesus is contradicting himself here or talking about spiritual bread. There's a difference between praying for tomorrow's bread and worrying about tomorrow. Prayer and worry are very different. One looks to God the Father in trust. The other looks at our lack in fear. Jesus meant literal bread. Jesus is speaking into the social situation, a particular social situation where one cannot simply take for granted that there will be food for the next day. And we've had a tiny, tiny taste of that when we struggled to get essentials from the supermarket a few weeks back. That's easing now, thank goodness. But I did actually have to pray for bread just this last week, actually. Last weekend, Jenny came down with a sore throat. And although a sore throat is not a common symptom of coronavirus, we had to get tested just as a precaution and obviously stay at home. And we couldn't go to the shop. And it came at the worst time because we were just about to do our weekly shop. And guess what? We had no bread for the next day. We had no bread for tomorrow. And so it happened, Je Jenny's parents very kindly brought us bread and milk and some other essentials and our tests came back as negative a day or two later, thank goodness. And Jenny's back at work now feeling much better. What I'm trying to say here is that for all of us, our ability to get essentials has been somewhat disrupted over the last month or so. And it's giving us a window into how many people live all around the world. People who are praying for bread or rice very literally. Their prayer, even now as I speak, even now as you hear these words, there are people all around the world who are very literally praying for bread, praying for rice. Even though I could pop out to the shop to get some bread right now, I've now had a taste of not being able to do that. And so when I pray, give us today our daily bread, or more accurately, give us today our bread for tomorrow, I'm more aware of the people who might not be able to do that and I'm including them in my prayer. At best this prayer is a prayer of solidarity, praying for ourselves 
along with others and offering ourselves to be the answer to those people's prayers, just like Jenny's parents were when they brought bread for us just this last week. And so when you next pray the Lord's Prayer and pray, give us this day, I wonder if that us will be larger for you than just uh, the, the, than it was before. I wonder if this us will be so large that it's almost like the us in Horace's artwork that includes dog walkers, cyclists, pushchair pushers and runners. So we've looked at father, we've looked at bread, now let's look at forgiveness. In our reading, the words are forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. We usually pray this as forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And like I mentioned earlier, we're not looking at every part of the Lord's Prayer, just the extraordinary parts. And so why is this particular part extraordinary? Well, the forgive us our sins part was very common, very common in Jewish prayers of the time. It was the second part, as we forgive those who sin against us. As one commentator, Ulrich Lutz, puts it, in my opinion, there is no case where human action is taken into a central prayer text in this way. So we find that the critical nature of human forgiveness is brought right into the heart of a prayer for divine forgiveness in a new way. This connection between divine forgiveness and human forgiveness is further solidified by Jesus' words after the prayer, where he essentially says, if you're not open to forgiving other human beings, why do you expect God to forgive you? And implicit in all of this is the idea that we all sin and that forgiveness could be another daily need alongside our daily bread. I realise that sin is a dead word to most of society, but the reality behind it is alive and well. Francis Spufford defines sin as the human propensity to mess things up and break things. I really like that definition. I'll repeat that. Sin is the human propensity to mess things up and break things. For many of us, lockdown is going to make us more sensitive to this human propensity, either because we're living in closer proximity to people or because we're home alone with ourselves and might notice things in ourselves that we didn't see before, or because we're coming into contact with people out in public who are more anxious in lockdown and might not be regulating, self-regulating their behaviour like they would normally. I don't need to illustrate all of this with examples because if you've heard what I just said, your own examples will already be springing to mind. The Lord's Prayer invites us to bring all of these things to God. And when we do, we might ask God for forgiveness or ask for help to forgive others or confess our sin to God or be prompted to apologise to someone and seek forgiveness or even forgive ourselves. Lockdown, because of the way it reveals both the best and worst of human nature, is an ideal season to grow in our capacity to forgive and seek forgiveness. And the Lord's Prayer gives us a kind of framework for that and reminds us in an extraordinary way that the quality, the quality of our relationship with God is intertwined with the quality of our relationships to one another. Once again, we might consider how big the those who sin against us category is. Can we extend forgiveness to many or just those who apologise? Just to our loved ones or to our enemies too? Perhaps the those might get larger for you as you go through life, a bit like how the us in Horace's artwork seems to include everyone on the promenade, dog walkers, cyclists, pushchair pushers and runners. To draw this together, I hope you try out the Lord's Prayer for yourself. You don't have to reel it off. Actually, take time, go slow with it. Take time to inhabit each line like it's a room in a building that you're entering into. Let the our and the us and the those be filled with all sorts of people that are taken up into your prayers. And my hope is that the Lord's Prayer will increase the dimensions of your heart and that the Lord's Prayer will help you become a more magnanimous person, a person with a big soul. 
May the love of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit enfold you this day and always. Amen. So may the peace of the Lord Christ go with you, wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. And may he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. <laughs>